Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. A- 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 Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Hello, all you Mario brothers and Donkey Kongs out there. It's time to put down those barrels and get comfortable for another episode of Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. And here he is with an armload of showbags and a belly full of Dagwood dogs. It's Matthew Dickerson. What a week it has been, Matt. It has been a pretty busy week, but I want to know, are you a Mario or a donkey? What do you do, prefer? Do you know what? I would, As a young fellow, I would have said I was a Donkey Kong all the way through. Right. Uh, but no, I think I'm more of a Mario now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And thank you very much for Mario and his wacky wheels. The Mario Kart was a revolution when it happened back in the mid-90s there. It was. And it, it was. really brought to life the flat that I was living in with uh, all my footy mates and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. So this week, what I want to talk about is... When people move house, in the old days, close to the bone. <laughs> I'm going back <laughs> decades ago now. <laughs> you expected certain services in your house, so you expected maybe electricity, maybe running water, maybe sewerage, and of course there are certain rural properties that might not have had all those things. But there were certain basic expectations if you were living in a town or a city. I think that's pretty fair enough. Now it's at the point that obviously the expectation is some form of internet connectivity. But it's, it's getting more than that. It's actually at the point now when you talk to a real estate agent, they'll actually have people turn up and they'll say, sure, it's got the internet. Every house has got the internet. But which version of the internet? And agents have to become experts on whether it's got fibre to the premises or fibre to the node or fibre mm-hmm. to the curb or fixed wireless or only old-fashioned satellite type things. And people can be caught out a little bit sometimes because – the agent might say, sure, it's got internet connectivity. Every house has got electricity mm. and internet connectivity, but it's the type of internet connectivity that really can make a difference. And sometimes I think agents are probably going to start advertising going forward the type of internet connectivity. And so you see a few examples yeah, of this from time to time. Yeah. yeah, it can keep um, uh, an adolescent very happy or very unhappy uh, if you choose the wrong house. <laughs> well, it's not so much choosing the wrong house. There are probably <laughs> solutions to try and fix up some of those problems, but it's that first expectation. You get in, you just turn on or you connect the electricity and you turn the lights, the lights work. That's yeah. easy. It's it's kind of a binary answer. The lights work or the lights don't work. You don't say, oh, they're How only well 70. The work? That's right. The lights work. The electricity works. So that, I'm happy with that. And I turn water on. Sometimes, sometimes people might worry about the pressure. You get in the shower and that I'd hate to move into a new house. I love my water pressure. <laughs> and I'd hate to move into a new house and then get in the shower and go, oh, no, uh, I didn't check the water pressure. <laughs> I'm thinking of a but, Seinfeld episode there. Well, yeah. Possibly. <laughs> but I think that's almost a bit the same as internet connectivity now. You get the yeah. new house, you move in and you turn it on, you go, oh, no, it's not as fast as I thought. What am I going to do now? I I don't want to pull out of the wholesale just because of the (laughs) speed, but maybe I do. So anyway, it's interesting where we've come and the things that we see as absolute basics now compared to what it might have been, say, 20 years ago. And, yeah, the internet is um, is lifeblood for some people. It's, mm. um, yeah, we, we just need things to run smoothly and fast. Well, I'm thinking for, about work from home there, but you're probably thinking about games. I'm, I'm thinking about keeping adolescents happy. <laughs> and, so, um, <laughs> so there's more games than work from home, isn't it? <laughs> uh, an Xbox is only a paperweight if you can't get it to run smoothly. <laughs> yeah, And, of course, all the games now rely on online connectivity. You, can't do much just in a little silo, can you? Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Anyway, keep that in mind when you're out there house hunting and make sure you've got an agent that knows what they're talking about with their internet connectivity. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Now, let's kick off with our first uh, first story for the day. Uh, the basic rule for a budding entrepreneur is see the need and feel the need. The pandemic of the last two and a half years has brought about, well, a lot of changes in the world and a lot of needs to be filled, shall we say. One unlikely market, perhaps not so unlikely under the circumstances perhaps, is the pet market, with ownership growing from 61% to 69% of all Australian households. And so it makes sense that we might see a bit of a swell in fancy tech gadgets aimed squarely at enhancing the pet ownership experience. Matt, there are some cool gadgets out there today for the moggy or the little pup. You're right. And that's actually quite incredible. That's from before the pandemic to after the pandemic. That's yeah. going from 61 to 69. Um, that's a lot of houses. It is, isn't it? When you think about basically seven out of every 10 households have got a pet in those houses, that's incredible. So there's no surprise, as you say, that technology features strongly in some of these. And you've got probably pet feeders, I see, as the main area that have got some comparison there or some progress that's been made because people want to be able to leave their 
dog and know that it's being fed and watered okay. They don't mm. want to take it out to the kennel. That might get a bit expensive. But if I just have it locked up in the home, have a doggy door somewhere, they can get in and out, but they can be fed. I'm happy with all that. But that's all well and good. I want to see the dog or the cat to make sure that the, the feeder is working yeah, okay. correctly and make sure that's fine. So you've now got to the point where you've got pet feeders with cameras built in and so you can check on the dog and the cat then and say <laughs> right the dog that's happy i can see that they can't see you but you can see them then you can make some noise so you can have a and i say in inverted commas a conversation with the dog so you can talk to the dog the dog might get a bit confused going i can hear james's voice but where's it coming from <laughs> so you can check on those things and then if you're really worried about it you can actually almost use it as a bit of home security because you can actually see that live feed of the camera so if there's a noise that goes on or something happening at your house you can check through your dog feeder then there's an SD card you can put in, so rather than stream everything to you all the time, you can check exactly what the dog did while you were away. Ah, so all sorts of these see. things are built in now. You know, I had a friend who was feeding his neighbour's cat uh, because the, the neighbour's cat worked out how to get into his house right. and start feeding. And I, I, well, they didn't have cameras for it, but they just caught the thing. I reckon that'd be good for catching um, neighbours' dogs and cats. Well, put it house. outside and then, yeah, catch the neighbours' dogs and cats. So, so and, and yell at them. You can tell them or come home and talk to your neighbour, maybe. Where's the proof? Well, actually, I've got a video here to show you. Yeah. I actually had to feed. It was a, a long story a long time ago, but I had to look after a house for some relatives of ours, and they had a budgerigar. And I didn't have any automatic feeder, and I hadn't had a budgerigar before, so I looked after the house and looked after the farm and did all the things I was meant to do, and came in one day, and the budgerigar was dead. So, oh, so I didn't do a very good job. But you needed an automatic feeder. Exactly right. The funny part was I went and found a budgerigar, bought a new one ah. that, that replicated <laughs> I took the old one in, said, here's what I wanted it to look like, bought a new one, and I felt too guilty when they came back home, and I said, oh, look, I'm sorry, the Padre guy died. And before I told them I'd replace it, oh, thank goodness, we we're trying to work out how to get rid of that bird. Oh, no, no, I bought oh! you a new one. <laughs> But you're right. What I did need was an automatic feeder for the budgerigar, even though I was there in the same house. But if the owners of the budgerigar had have had the automatic feeder and the camera, yeah. they could have seen that I wasn't actually looking after it very well <laughs> and said, Matthew, do something about it's that budgerigar. It's not that hard a job. Well, you wouldn't think so, would you? So I was a bit younger and maybe a bit less responsible than I am now. But you can do all sorts of things as the feeders, those pets that you can put on little tags so you can actually see what your dog gets up to during the day. Oh, so wow. if you go to work for the day and you come home and the dog, geez, there's a fair bit of dust or dirt on the dog. Where's it been? I wonder, <laughs> there's no dirt dug up in the yard. Where's that dog been today? So you can actually track them. It. And you see it's been down the street. It's see? gone down to the river by itself. And <laughs> That's had right. a swim. It's come back. and <laughs> Smoked a few joints and <laughs> come back home. Hang so with his mates. all sorts of yeah, pet right. technology. So it is a, a booming industry. They're saying that one particular company said that their sales for one of their common items, pet cameras, have gone up by 150% over the last year. And that's not a huge surprise given the pet ownership's increased, but also the technology's getting better, it's getting cheaper, and people are wanting to use it more. And I suppose people, even though they're working from home, they still want to work out ways that they can make it easy when they go back to work. Mm. Some people might have got a pet when they've been working from home, and they know one day they'll have to go back to work. So what am I going to do then with my pet? How am I going to keep an eye on it? So they go to technology. So Goodness. I love the idea that technology is being used to solve some of these problems. In fact, problems we didn't know that we had, i.e. being able to automatically feed the dog rather than actually go out to the, to the pantry and get some food out and feed the dog. <laughs> but this is where we're headed now, and so this whole pet technology area is booming. Yep, and hopefully we can get something to walk the dogs as well, take them around the block. Maybe that's uh, for another day. Matt, first world problems are a major concern these days, uh, a major source of anxiety to say the least. For example, when there's too much orange zest in your brunch mimosa, well, what are you going to do? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> and I don't, I don't think I have the answer to that one. Or, or what about when you have three monitors for your dex desktop and it, it takes you too long to find where the curse, cursor for your mouse is? That little arrow there. No one knows what to do about that. Well, how about when you're just so tired of having to plug your phone in to charge it? It's just too much of an effort. Surely, Matt, in 2022, there has to be an answer, something easier. Well, I'm still stuck on... The best way to locate your cursor, cursor when you've got your got three, three monitors, screens. that's right. And there are some tools now you can actually use that you can actually hit so it can actually ping and zero in on that. So you, <laughs> I think that's probably one way to solve it. But but it is a problem, isn't it? But anyway, this problem can be solved as well. When you haven't got enough charge in your phone and you hate it when you get towards the end of the day and you're running out of charge, and you might you carry a little in. charging brick around with you and just plug it in or find a PowerPoint somewhere, and they're all a bit tiresome. Wireless chargers are great, but they're usually a little bit bigger unless you've got a wireless charger sweater. 
So this is where Wearable we're at. wireless charger. That's right. So a particular person over at the University of Tokyo in Japan now has basically created a sweater that's got coils of liquid metal that run around in silicon tubes on the sweater. <laughs> you actually obviously had to plug a battery into those coils. So somewhere on you, there's a battery that you plug in. But then that creates a wireless charge out of your sweater. So you just put your phone anywhere on your body and it will wirelessly charge. <laughs> so wireless chargers, normally you've got to get them on somewhere around the right spot and sometimes even angle it the right way. But this is set up so that it puts out enough electromagnetic field that you can put it anywhere on your body. So you might have some pockets in the sweater or you might just have a jacket over the sweater, for example. Put it in your inside pocket of your jacket. As long as it's resting up pretty close to the sweater, that'll start to charge it. It sounds quite useless. No, it sounds quite incredible. The the technology behind it. I don't know that it'll go off that well. One of the problems they're having at the moment is the fabrication process. They finally have to do it manually because you don't want to, for example, pierce a silicon tube and have liquid metal running out because that looks a bit messy, I think, and probably stops it from working properly. So there are some problems like that they're going to have in terms of the production of it at the moment. It's a prototype, but it works. And I actually watched a video of it and it really was put the phone literally anywhere over your body around these (laughs) coils and you wipe you charge your phone. Walking, talking charger <laughs> yourself. Now, of course, people. The first thing that people say to me is, "Oh no, this is going to damage our body." But of course, the electromagnetic signal being put out is non-ionizing radiation and very low power non-ionizing. So, mm. I'd be quite comfortable wearing it. I don't think I'd have any health problems associated with it. Some people do find that a bit strange. So, you don't need the aluminium helmet at all. No, and probably not an aluminium body suit, body suit underneath either. either. Yeah. I do worry about going through security at the airport. I just think that's going <laughs> to going to create some crazy things, and then when no, you say, sir, "I'm just charging," I'm just char- I'm just charging. Take your sweater off. Sir. Can you can you imagine the sweater <laughs> with these coils through it, and it's making the poor machine go crazy? <laughs> and you're trying to explain, I just. And wearing this to charge my phone, I'm not sure they'd be no. completely believable. So it might have some issues with travelling. If you're travelling in a plane, that could be an issue. But it does sound like just. The point we're getting to where you're going to be able to charge your devices, your phones, anywhere. Desks, we've already talked about those. You can mm. have coils underneath your desk in one spot, but why not have a, a desk that just has coils throughout the whole lot? And I think that's where this particular research is going. Where can we have chargers? How can we have chargers? What other devices? Watches, phones, AirPods, all sorts of things you just be able mm. to charge up by sitting down anywhere, let's face it. In the reclining position. Is Netflix run by millennials? Because there's this uh, story here, live free-to-air TV is still a thing, though I wouldn't be terribly surprised if a large demographic didn't know this. Paying for subscription TV to me is still a fairly new thing, but I guess it all comes down to perspective. Well, in a radical new move, Netflix is now looking at, wait for it, live streaming, which, if I'm not mistaken, Matt, is quite a bit like free-to-air TV. You say those words, free-to-air TV, as if our listeners understand what you're saying, James. But it is a bit like Back to the Future, isn't it? It's 7 o'clock on a Wednesday evening, and I've got to turn on the TV to watch MacGyver. And, of course, I tell that story to my kids, and they say, what do you mean, turn on at 7 o'clock? What do you mean? You've got to be there in front of the TV and watch it. At the time that they're streaming it. That's right. And at the time, and you've got to watch the ads and make sure you don't miss the next part. So they don't get it. They just think and I'm talking about my kids, millennials, Mm. they just think you turn on the TV, go to your favourite streaming show and start streaming it. So for Netflix to say, we're going to do a live stream, (laughs) that would be a revolutionary, blow your mind, new concept from Netflix. So you'd have to tune in only when they're presenting the live stream. That's it. What a concept. (laughs) My goodness. (laughs) So it does seem like it's a bit back to the future. And you do say, well, why would you do that, Netflix? Surely the model you've got is so much more convenient. It's really about keeping up with competitors. Disney Plus aired a live stream of the Academy Awards. So it was the first streaming organisation to actually show the Academy Awards as a live stream. And that went really well because the Academy Awards has got a certain time it has to be at. Like Can when I the also awards say, are running. just for the older generation, Disney just played the Academy Awards. That's what they did. That's they right. filmed it and they played it. <laughs> That's all they did. While it was happening. <laughs> While it was happening. <laughs> right. So live stream. It's like live TV. <laughs> <laughs> so Netflix said, we can't get, let a competitor get in front of us, so we better do some live streaming as well. So they're going to do some comedy specials, some live stream comedy specials. Now, I'm pretty sure you can turn in when it's happening and then also 
afterwards and stream mm. it like normal. But I think they'll create a bit of hype around these live streams. I think they'll try and get people excited to say, mm. hey, we're live streaming this at a certain time. Tune in to you can be the first to see it right at the time that it's actually streaming, not later on, not wait till some friend talks about it at work. You can actually catch it <laughs> when it's happening. Deal it, with the spoilers. Yeah, it, yeah, it does. It does sound, let's say, that, that whole idea that, isn't this the advantage of streaming? But again, Netflix are trying different things. They've lost a bit of share market price. They're trying to make sure they stay relevant. Mm. This is one of the ways they're trying to stay relevant. So interesting. I just I wonder how the millennials will accept this and whether they'll say, well, this is a crazy idea. I just want to watch it when I want to watch it. And everything old is new again. <laughs> now, some of your stories, Matt. I don't know if they excite me or scare the hell out of me, but I get very nervous and worried about this next piece. When my father went to borrow $6,000 to buy a house in the early 70s, the bank manager deliberated for a couple of days before he contacted Dad back and he said, and now Dad had a, a, stable, a stable government department job at the time, um, took him a couple of days and rang Dad back to knock him back for the $6,000 loan. Too much risk, you see. Fast forward to 2022 and things have changed somewhat. With an average mortgage being around five or $600,000, banks are now beginning to approve mortgages over the phone or on PC in as little as 10 minutes. I can't help but feel that this is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, it's interesting because, again, they're trying to appeal to a market that doesn't understand the whole idea. And I'm a bit of same waiting. as you. Of, I have memories of even myself, the first loan I tried to go and get for a, a business loan. I got dressed up in my suit and had an appointment with a bank manager and I had to go in and sit down and wait until he was ready to see me. Mm. And then I'd go in and try and show him all these wonderful financials and all the rest of it. And the world's changed now. You used to try and impress your bank manager. Now banks are going, well, it's a competitive market out there. Yeah. We'll come out and see the customers. We'll come out and make it easier for them. But still, when you've got millennials who just do things on the phone, oh, I need a new account for my streaming service. I just get on my phone. I type in the details and there you go. Bang, I've got an account. Done. Why should it be any harder than that? So I know from experience talking to some millennials, they talk about this whole idea of going to the bank, applying for a loan, waiting for an answer back like you talked about with your dad, really? Surely you've got <laughs> access to all the information you need and you can just say, yep, you're a good risk or not. Now, one of the things that's going to make it a lot easier and, and where this story is relying on is that financial institutions were given till the 1st of February this year to make all the data that's available in the banking realm available to share amongst the banks. So there should be no reason that you can't go into your bank then and say, I'd like a loan, here's my track record, and they can look up your accounts with your bank, obviously, but they can also see what you've got with other banks. You might have a credit card with someone else, or you might mm. have some other loan where you've gone into a shop and they said, 1,000 days interest-free, so that's another loan with someone else. All that data is now being shared behind the scene, so you can get a really good snapshot, or the bank can get a really good snapshot of you and your lending history, your credit history, without having to make sure you're telling the truth. You can just, they can look it all up, for example. But it's at the point now, why why should you be waiting with a bank? Why should you be waiting any time at all? So this is exactly where one bank, they've got a new digital loan process called Unloan, where you literally do fill in your details and they say, a home user, not a business, a home user, fill in your details, 10 minutes, you'll have your answer. Wow. So you could be at an auction and go, I wasn't going to bid on this auction for this house. I thought it was going to go too dear, but gee, the price is a bit cheaper than I thought. Oh, quick, pull my phone out, quick application. Yep, I'm approved for that house loan. Yep, I can start bidding in the auction now. That still makes my heart skip a beat when you say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, I think I'm going to impulse buy a house. <laughs> 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 well, I'm hoping they thought about it a little bit beforehand, but it is actually crazy. Some of the processes we have that we accept, and I know my daughter bought a house a little while ago, and I said to her when she did the, the deal and came up with the price and everything was right, she goes, oh, great. And she just said to me, oh, good, I'll be able to move in next week. And I went, oh, it's about six weeks. And she couldn't understand that. And I must <laughs> admit, when I said to her it's six weeks and she asked me to explain it, I couldn't explain it either. Yeah, I thought it had to be in six weeks. That's right, because yeah. in the old days, there was so much that had to go on behind the scenes. And then yeah. you used to have the deed come around to the solicitor's office, yeah. and the bank would turn up with a bank check. Well, they don't even have deeds anymore. No, that's right. But it was all physically done with these bits of paper, and I don't know why it took so long to get to that point. But now, it's all done like PEXA is all yeah. used for the financial side of the transaction, and as you say, the electronic deeds. And so... Yeah, why is it six weeks? I don't know the answer to that. Someone please tell me the answer to that. But it's a bit the same as this. Why should it take so long for a home loan? You've got my details. You know 
what my job is. I can upload my pay slip and you've got everything there available to you. So just give me the loan, please. And if you won't, well, th- someone else will. I think the trouble is, is that um, uh, for anyone who lived through the 70s, 80s and even 90s, we knew that you, know, you had to wait for things. <laughs> <laughs> no. I remember ordering stuff you know, um, by mail. And so you'd have to send the letter off. You waited for that letter to arrive at the, the place that you were placing the order with. And then that you had to wait for them to send the stuff out to you. When you used to do money orders. And a month like Yeah, yeah. Money and we, yeah, that, that would eventually come to you. Yep. This idea of, I, I need money to buy a house. I need it in 10 minutes. <laughs> Bang, I'm going to get that money. For, I'm going to buy that house. Now I'd like to move in and it's almost evening. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Look, it's getting dark. Can I hurry up and move in? It's a bit cold out here. <laughs> Oh, so yeah. it is quite incredible, but I, I see a lot of logic in this because there are some institutions that need a bit of a shake-up, and the reality is, and this is this particular one here, I won't say the actual brand name, I won't say the bank name, but this is a major bank. The reality is there are lenders out there, small lenders, agile, nimble, mm. you hear about this, those sort of terms with businesses, and these big banks, if they keep sticking to the old way of doing things, before they know it, they'll blink and holy truth, where do all my customers redundant. go? Yeah, so yeah. it's a good move by one of the major banks. But again, it's uh, yeah, it's a bit scary. But I think this is what the the market expects. Consumers expect this sort of service. Now, are you still worried about how far you're going to get on a battery charge, and then how long it'll take you to charge it up if you decide to go with an EV? Your excuses are becoming more and more feeble, folks. Battery swapping for a quick and easy pit stop has been a thing for a while now in China, and it has now kicked off in Europe as well. Matt, it still might be a little way from us down under, though. Well, who knows? With the change of government, we might actually see a little bit more action on things with electric cars, but no surprise here. battery swapping, yeah. Well, they're going to... So you're right, in China at the moment, They've got about, this is NIO, which is their car, their electric car, has built with the ability for the battery to be swapped. So that's where they believe the sweet spot is for EVs. They believe people don't want to hang around and charge up. So they've built the car so that literally the battery from the bottom unbolts, drops out, and a new one goes in. The whole process takes less than five minutes. So probably not much different to filling up with fuel at a petrol station. They've built something like 800 battery swapping stations in China, they sold 90,000 EVs last year. So there's a wow. good market for that. And again, this is one brand. I don't think they're at the point where they've got a common sharing of the architecture, which I think is where it would need to go if this is going to be really successful. But again, if you're a market leader, if you're building lots of cars and selling lots of cars, you can kind of have your own battery swapping stations. But imagine if you had petrol stations where, oh, sorry, we can only handle brand A, B and C at this particular petrol station. You have to go up the road for Mm. another petrol station that does your particular brand of car, which is kind of what's happening here. But they've gone to Norway now and no surprise there. If you want to go somewhere to try and break into the EV market, go somewhere where lots of people buy EVs, and Norway Mm. is that place. So they've gone to Norway. They've built their first battery swapping station. Obviously, they'll start to sell the cars in Norway as well. You can still charge it up as per normal, but they believe there's a market there for people that want to be able to swap batteries out, people that might just charge up normally as they're going about their daily work, but sometimes they go on those long road trips and they're not able to swap batteries out. And it sounds pretty simple. I watched a little video and basically you book it in on an app, you book in your slot at the station, you go to an app, you book it in, you turn up there, you back it in, and then once you get in the right spot, the little bells go off, it tells you you're in the right spot, and you just sit there. And you sit there yeah. out of the car, in the car, five minutes. You get yourself some chips at the... Exactly right. They'll probably make more money out of the chips and the battery swap. The good part about it is... The batteries are then charged in the right way. Mm. The battery's always a better quality battery. It's not like you've abused that battery and not charged it very well or keep topping it up or doing damage to it in some way. You're always getting a new battery coming in or probably not always a brand new battery, but you know that it's going to be a high quality battery. The stations can do, individual stations can do over 240 swaps a day. So that makes sense with less than five minutes each. And so at the moment they're talking about getting say 20 up and going in Norway and then see if they build from there. They actually believe that it's not going to be the way of the future for Europe because they think Europe's progressed far enough that charging infrastructure will probably be the dominant way, but they still think there's a bit of a market there for them. So that's one model. But going further than this, they actually think there's a potential model there where you'll start to buy cars without a battery. 
which doesn't sound like a very good electric vehicle mm. without a battery. But what you'll do is you'll buy the car, you'll pick out whatever car you want in their range, and then you won't buy the battery, you'll just lease a battery. So you'll pay a monthly fee yeah, so that right. you can pull into a charging station and either charge up or just swap the battery out, and you're never owning the battery. It's just always leased from the company. So different models out there to try and address people's different problems or issues or reasons they give for not buying an electric vehicle. I think there's just so many different models we'll see. I don't know what will be the winner out of all those models, but I know the winner will be electric vehicles in the end. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, watch this space, folks. It sounds so interesting. This next story has got question marks all over it, like the Riddler's spandex jumpsuit. What the hell is a gravity battery, and how could it be a solution to the world's energy storage issues? Well, gravity batteries are a lot like our Snowy Mountain Scheme. So hydro storage, hydro power, you often hear people talk about. Relying on things falling and waterfalls. Waterfalls, that's right. So when you go to somewhere that's a hydro battery, so you often hear talk about hydro batteries, it'll be somewhere where you've got a body of water at a height and then at a lower height, another body of water. And when you've got excess power in the middle of the day, for example, solar panels are pumping out the power, not everyone needs the power then, they run some pumps to pump the water back up into the storage facility up higher. And then in the middle of the night, you might need that power or you need some extra power at any particular point in time. Open the gates, water falls down, spin some generators. It's a really quick way to bring power online. And it's actually quite an effective way of storing power because the efficiency in terms of pumping that water up and then dropping it back down, you don't lose a lot. And I'm going to guess this isn't a well-researched figure here, but you probably only lose around about 5% each time you do that. So it's a pretty effective way of storing power. So great. That's fantastic if you just happen to have a large body of water water. below another large body body of water. So when you've got those situations, i.e. our Snowy Mountain Scheme, Happy days. If you happen to live somewhere flat, like we are out here, we've got flat, flat, and then we've got some more flat, it's not easy to go and build a body of water at a higher level and then build another body of water at a lower level Mm. because sometimes we also have drought. So then what happens to those bodies of water? So there are companies out there that use weights, normally concrete, sometimes steel weights, in that same sort of process. Then they build little devices, and when I say little, they're probably quite large, in terms of pulleys and the weights, Same sort of concept. In the middle of the day, you've got some excess power. Run the motors that spin the pulleys to bring those weights up to a high level, increase your potential energy. Then when you need that power, you just spin it the other way. That potential energy turns into kinetic energy. That spins from generators, generates electricity. One of the problems we used to always hear about with coal-fired power stations is if we needed extra power on the grid, it took a long time to fire up, excuse the pun, a coal-fired power station. Mm. And hence, we had coal-fired power stations that would sit there, turn away the whole time, generate electricity. We didn't need it. The whole idea of off-peak power came about because of that, because they're burning the coal anyway. They're spinning the generators. We're also doing something with it. So off-peak power, try and use some of that in the middle of the night. But all of these solutions, whether it be a a gravity battery or whether it be hydropower, you've got the ability to turn that power on very quickly because, again, open the gates or just drop that weight. Yeah, right. That starts generating power straight away. So if you need that power now, well, turn it on. You're going to have it pretty much now. So there are some companies, for example, one's called Gravitricity, which I quite like the sound of. It's based over in Edinburgh, and they're basically doing a gravity battery that's 15-metre steel tower or maybe multiples of them, and they have a 50-tonne weight that sits on the bottom of that. And so, again, it lifts it up and then drops it down. So that's one particular one. And then there's another one, another concept by the same company where they look at mine shafts, and they say, well, why build this up out of the ground? Because we only need a differential between the high and the low. We could build it in a mine shaft, mine shaft not being used anymore. So we just need that differential so we can just... Pull it up so it's not actually building something up out of the ground, it's using the mine shaft down below. So you've got those concepts, but you've also got another concept in Switzerland called Energy Vault. And so they build a multiple series of these weights in something that would be larger than a container, like a couple of containers base, and then obviously a bit of height to it. So they have multiple of these weights, and then they can bring on more powers as needed. So they might just drop one weight with a little bit of power is needed, but multiple weights can be turned on. So it looks very complicated. When I looked at a picture of one of these, lots of weights in there, but again, each weight has the same basic concept. It's got a pulley that can generate power when it's going down or use power to pull it back up again. Again, the efficiency of these is very good. So it's a really clever way to store power 
And I think long term, you use batteries to store power, they're chemical. They slowly break down over time. Mm. And if they're not used at all, then you actually lose. Sometimes the, the number that's shown around is about 1% of charge per month you might lose in some of these large batteries. So if it's not being used, you might actually lose some of that power. So you've got to pump a bit more power in to keep it topped up. As you can see, the logic here, you bring a weight up to the top, it doesn't it slowly sits. fall down. It just sits there and waits until you're so ready you're to use it. it. Yeah, yeah, so right. it's, it's That's a really amazing. Cool yeah, it is. It's, it's fantastic. But again, a bit like with electric vehicles we talked about in the last story, there are people coming up with solutions. So when people say, oh, that solar power, that's no good, or wind power's no good, mm. there are people coming up with solutions on how to store power because in the coal-fired, I mean, storing power would have still made sense in coal-fired days, but it didn't even register on the radar. It was just, mm, throw some more coal in, just yeah. burn it a bit more, <laughs> spin those generators. We're not using all the power. Oh, who cares? We've got heaps of coal. Whereas now we're saying we might not always have good supply of power. We might not always have readily supply available power with renewables so we need to come up with storage and this is just one of the solutions that's being thought up and actually in probably prototype stage I call it there actually are some little test cases now where they're building some of these and being used but they're probably still at prototype stage mm. yeah so interesting and um, yeah the energy crisis right now is it's the the biggest well, one of the biggest issues uh, on the planet uh, what a way to come around, around with a solution <laughs> Now, Australia has led the charge on Google paying news outlets for content. Now, Google is set to pay more than 300 European Union publishers for news. And news is big business once again, Matt. Yeah, it is. This is really good news. And it's actually, excuse the pun again, I'm full of them today, but ah, it, it, it is actually you quite You can't say good. excuse the pun and then just go and dance right <laughs> in. But anyway, let's go with it. The Australian government did get a pretty hard time when they were putting the pressure on companies like Facebook and Google to say, I'm sorry, you're getting lots of people using your site because they're interested in the news. Another company had to pay employees to go and research that, mm. do the story, and they're doing all that work, which is costing the money, and you're just taking it for free. And so Google mounted a campaign, you may remember, yeah. to basically – say the Australian government was terrible. Look at how terrible they're, they're after doing this and it's going to cost you more money and the, all sorts of terrible things were going to happen. And it wasn't about Australia. The little tiny pittance that the Australian government said you should pay the news providers in Australia was so small that it wouldn't have even registered. It would have been more lunch money the Google executives would have spent in a day. But their big issue, obviously, is what's coming to fruition now. It wasn't about Australia. It was about the rest of the world. Yeah, if Australia was successful, what was going to happen across the rest of the world? And we're seeing that now. So they're now paying 300 EU publishers. So that's a lot. I can't tell you the figure they're paying them, but I can't imagine they're paying each of them 50 cents each. I can imagine they're paying them a lot. Yeah. And I know, for example, the ABC, which gets paid money by Google here in Australia and obviously other news providers will, but I know some particular people that have now got an, a job or a new job at the ABC based solely on Google money. So they've actually created extra jobs out of it to create better content hmm. based on that. So it's actually giving us better news as a result of that. Or for some organisations, it might just mean they can continue to exist. Because in the past, if all the news was being read on these various outlets and they weren't watching it on the news or listening on the radio or reading the newspaper, then some of those organisations may not exist today. So it's giving us better news. And in a free democratic society, we really need to make sure we've got good access to news. So at the moment, agreements have been had with 300 national local and specialist news publications across Germany, Hungary, France, Austria, Netherlands, many more. So it's happening. But I don't think this is the end of it. There are more companies in Europe who are saying, yes, we want to be part of this as well. More countries over in Europe. So I think we're going to see more 300 today, 500, 1,000, 3,000. You can see why these big companies were worried about it in the first place. I'll be interested to see, and I don't know if we'll ever find out, how much the total bill is finally once all these agreements are done across the world. Thank you, Mr. Google, for being socially responsible. <laughs> when you've been told you've got to do it. That's right. Yeah, thank you for, for being a good citizen after you were made to be a good citizen. A global citizen. The Tesla effect. What is it? Is it even a thing? And if it is, how can I get some? Does it hurt? Matthew, help me out here. The <laughs> Tesla effect. Well, the Tesla effect is everyone wants to be the next Tesla. Yeah. And I'm talking about various devices that use petrol now, then there's a whole transformation going on across the industry, across 
lawnmowers, across boats, across snowmobiles. It's electrifying everything and getting everything run by your laptop. And think about snowmobiles, for example. When I did read one story there, and there was a, a, an organisation that said they've got new snowmobiles going out through the Canadian woods, out through the snowland there. And you can just imagine you're out there for a weekend, you want to connect with nature, you're out amongst these beautiful woods in Canada and you've got this beautiful pristine snow and you're looking out across and then what's that noise? It's a snowmobile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ripping across there, echoing against the trees and across the mountains around uh, the area, causing avalanches, all sorts of things. But a snowmobile that's electric, obviously you just hear the noise of the snow being ridden over, like skiing. Skiing's a beautiful sport from a solitude point of view. You're just at one with nature, until you hit a tree, of course, but <laughs> at one with nature going down <laughs> the slopes. You're really at one with nature. You yeah. really are. So there are, there are snowmobiles out there being made. Electric mowers, that's one of the real areas it's, we're really seeing some progress in at the moment. Gasoline-powered mowers are being banned in some areas in Canada, sorry, in California, 2024, in lots of places, maybe a few years after that. That's having a big impact, but it's actually a market that's a pretty easy one because with your mower, you're not really that worried about range anxiety. Mm. You're not saying, what if I get halfway through the mowing of my lawn and I run out of battery power, what am I to do then? (laughs) So obviously you walk inside and swap the batteries over and keep going, or if you haven't got spare batteries, you walk inside, plug in the batteries and then go and have a a soft drink, and then come back and keep mowing the lawn later. So there are some things that seem really obvious, but I do love the fact that you've got so many garden implements now, whether it be chainsaws, whether it be whippersnippers, all those things. And I remember when I used to send my wife out to do the whippersnipping, getting the whippersnipper going, she could never get it going, so I used to have to start it for her. I had to get off the lounge, (laughs) go and start it for her, and then hand it over to her, making sure she was blipping the throttle to keep it going. These are more first world problems. (laughs) That's right, and not come inside and hassle me when she (laughs) maybe stalled it while she was doing the garden work, whereas now I just say, put the battery in, darling, and off you go. So the garden influence is an area that is exploding, and that is a market that really is going well. And I do like some of the companies that are coming out now with one battery that suits all of their range. So it it makes sense, rather than just have something you've got to plug in and have a different battery for different things, or maybe a battery built in. Having a whole plug-in station set up, you've just got the one charger. It, It makes perfect sense, and lots of those devices, I'm sure they sell more of them once they get someone hooked onto their brand. So it is happening. But the big Tesla effect is each company that says we're going to be the next Tesla. So it's happening with boats. We've had some discussion around boats previously, happening with snowmobiles, happening with electric mowers, ride-on mowers. That's an area that hasn't taken off so much yet. The push mowers around the yard, but the ride-on mowers, slightly bigger areas, that hasn't really taken off with electric versions of those yet. But again, there are companies out there, and everyone tells their investors when they're talking about their company, we're the next Tesla of Right on moles or the next Tesla of bolts yeah, or whatever right. it might be because everyone is immediately familiar with what you're doing there. Someone asked me the other day whether I like Elon Musk or not and I don't have an opinion on him as a personality but in terms of what he's done, he has changed the world in terms of the cars that we are now driving and will drive in the near future. And that's not too bad a thing when you think about it. Whether you think that he's doing a great thing or a terrible thing, if you can say to people on your deathbed, well, I did actually change the world for – one part of it, then eh, it's not too bad. Hopefully in a positive way I'm positive talking about. Way. you know, Hitler might have changed the world, but maybe not such a positive thing. But he has changed the world in what he's done, and now people are quoting him or his company, a Tesla. And keep in mind, he didn't start Tesla, but he came along and really kicked along with some major investment in it. But people are referring to that company when they're talking about their other devices, which is pretty impressive. That is very cool. waiting for the next big thing in solar voltaics stop the clock researchers at the university of new south wales have done it and it's only 2022 they've discovered a way of generating solar power at night people but matthew it may be a little bit too soon to pop corks just yet i hear it does seem like somewhat a contradiction doesn't it Solar Solar power power at at night. night. (laughs) But as we know, the Earth receives a lot of solar energy at the equator, for example. At midday, you're about one kilowatt per square metre. So there's a fair bit of heat hitting the Earth during the day. Mm. And obviously, we see the effect of that overnight. The sun goes down and we don't suddenly drop to minus 273 degrees Celsius. I was almost going to say Kelvin then, zero Kelvin. (laughs) It doesn't drop to absolute zero overnight. Obviously, all that heat's been absorbed by the Earth and then slowly releases that heat overnight to keep us somewhat warm during the nighttime. And that's exactly what researchers are finding. They've come up with a way of designing solar panels that during the night 
actually capture some of that radiated heat that's going back out. The logic is photons are hitting the solar panel during the day, photons are coming out from the Earth during the night, slightly different frequencies, slightly different types of energy, but the energy is still being radiated out from the Earth. So you're right, let's not get too excited yet, because at the moment, the amount of power they're able to generate at night is about 100 thousandth of what you can generate during the day. So yeah, right. a little way to go yet, but I, I think the idea here is that you would still generate power during the day. You'd still have some batteries or some gravity devices that are storing some of that power, but the point is that you can still actually have some of that power being generated at night. So you're just making your solar panel more efficient. Collect lots of energy during the day on one side. At night time, you're still picking up some of that power underneath. And I think we also need to consider that we are just in 2022. Correct. So where's this going to be in another 10 years? Where's it going to be in another two decades? You know, um, so, yeah, the fact that we can harvest solar power during the evening, I think that's, that's significant. Well, people are thinking about it because I wouldn't have thought that was a thing. I wouldn't have sat around and been at a university and said, you know what, why don't we start doing some solar panel collection of power at <laughs> night time? Because I think people in the room that I was talking to them would have laughed at me and yes, said, what out, are you thinking about? Attention. That's right. <laughs> yeah, were you paying attention last week when we talked about the sun? So the idea that they're still coming up with different ways of generating power, I think is fantastic. And sure, 100,000th today, well, who, who knows what it's going to be in a month's time, six months' mm. time. Once you pay some attention to it, once some researchers look at it, once people say, oh, I've never thought of that. Let's see what we can do with it. Then there's potential there. Now, I don't know what the theoretical maximum you can generate. As I said, we know that one kilowatt of solar power hits the Earth per square metre at the equator at midday. So we, we know an absolute maximum we can generate. I don't know what the amount that's radiated back from the Earth, and I don't know the differential in terms of on the roof, for example, how much is radiated back out from the roof or does it need to be the Earth? A whole range of questions there. But I'm sure the researchers are thinking about all of those things as well, mm. and they'll come up with some answers, and they might find that it doesn't actually work, it's not worth building this into the solar panels, or in fact, it's really cheap to build into a solar panel, and even if we're only generating a few more kilowatt hours each night, it's still a few more kilowatt hours. And as you said, you're like um, uh, with uh, urban landscapes, you have so much cement and asphalt lying around the place that's mm. re-radiating this heat. Uh, if that could be caught and done something with Well, that's actually a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. It may actually be that, yes, you capture some of that at night, but even if the solar panel was built so it could capture some of that radiator during the day, so you mm. might actually get the first hit on one side of the solar panel, yeah. but just that radiation coming back during the day still might pick up some on the underside and then overnight picks up some as well. So that may be where researchers are headed as well. And one one hundred thousandth is still infinitely more than what we had in 2021. Yeah, that's right. Exactly <laughs> right. It's uh, it's not zero, is it? No, it's not zero. <laughs> and just like that, as the lights dim from the sustained power drain of the last 40 minutes of broadcasting, the hint has been dropped by our own technology. It's time for us to pack up and go home before we get go into a total blackout. Well, that's right. And I've got to go and get my lawn mowed yet and go and do the whipper snipping <laughs> and... <laughs> Thanks for another cracking tech talk, Matt. I think I might have to pop out and grab myself uh, and Gus the Cat, a new fandangled pet gadget of some sort. Um, a new pet feeder that I can watch him for, <laughs> from, from my bedroom. Mate. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, don't worry about going outside the house. No, no, no. I'll just, <laughs> yeah, just watch him eat uh, instead of watching the telly. Thanks for tuning in again, folks. It's been an absolute pr pleasure bringing you another episode of Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. I'm a post-COVID version of James Eddy, and I look forward to presenting another sterling episode in another week's time.